Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Well, we know we have access to your grace. We're just keenly aware of just how little we know. I just ask that you would strip away all foolishness but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In this series of uh, videos, we've been studying together uh, in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse. And in our last study together, I'm not sure what part that was, but we've come up along now to the point where I'm having trouble keeping track of the part numbers. We finished chapter 4, beginning chapter 5. We're just now beginning in chapter 5 of Romans, uh, the epistle to the Romans. But I want to ask you to turn back to the third chapter, beginning at verse 21, chapter uh, 3, verse 21. I spent a lot, a lot of time on this sentence. It's one long sentence in the Word of God that's been grossly distorted by modern Christianity. Almost every Christian, just about that I, at least that I've met, is familiar with Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But modern Christianity has taken that verse out of, con out of its context. They've taken it out of its meaning, and they've prescribed to it a meaning which is not biblical and which is not true. If you turn with me to chapter 3, you'll see that this sentence begins in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God separate from the law is manifested. It's a perfect passive. It is completely manifested. It's a completed transaction. We're looking at the present reality of that completion of the finished work of Christ being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, we're in the same sentence, and we saw it in the, the sacrifice made when Adam sinned, and from then on, all of the testimony of the law and the prophets to the vicarious suffering and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even that righteousness of God, it's a genitive, it's God's righteousness. Even God's righteousness, which is by means of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all, them that believe, for there is no difference. There's no difference in the way people are condemned, and there's no difference in the way that they are made righteous. By the disobedience of Adam, the many were made sinners, and even so, by in the same way, likewise, even so, by the obedience of Christ, that same group were made righteous. You had no choice in being a sinner, and you had no choice in being made righteous. Most Christians I've, I've met will admit that they had no choice in being made a sinner. Same is true of them being made righteous. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, who were those all? Well, look at the verse. Look at the verse. Upon all them that believe. For all of those that believe have sinned and come short of the glory of God. However, they are being justified freely by his grace. Same sentence. Same sentence. 
I have never heard anybody in the 30 years or more that I've been teaching the word, I have never heard a single Christian quote, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, having been freely justified by his grace. But it's the same sentence. You've got to stop and ask yourself why you don't hear that. All of those who sinned and came short of the glory of God, those believing, have been justified without a cause by the grace of God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth as a propitiation by means of the faithfulness of his sacrifice, the faith in his blood to declare his righteousness, God's righteousness, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare his righteousness and so forth. That ends the sentence. So the sentence goes from verse 21 to verse 26. In the middle of that sentence, a phrase has been grabbed out and grossly distorted. Those who believe are his sheep. John chapter 10. Why, why do you not believe me? Because you are not my sheep. And modern Christianity has rebelled against the biblical truth that only regenerated people believe and they have completely turned around the glory, the majesty, the wonder of God's grace and made it man-centered, not Christ-centered, man-centered. If you believe, if you'll believe, you'll be regenerated. That is not biblical. It's his sheep who believe. Being justified freely by his grace. Then we get over to chapter 5, verse 1. This is where we've come to in our studies here in this series in Romans. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the authorized version. I don't know what version you're using. Most of these videos, I use the authorized version. Now, allow me to take a slight departure from the norm here, okay? Uh, for the sake of those who love numbers, many of you know that I'm, I, I love numbers and their relationship to prophecy. As I know many of you out there do, Romans 5.1, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Well, last night, um, sitting up around board, I'm looking at the Greek word for peace. I noticed that it has a numerical value of 181. And the statement, I am that I am, equals 543. And also, God said to Moses, for I will be with you, with thee, Exodus 3.12. That sentence is 181, the numerical value of the word peace in the Greek. And I couldn't help but notice that there are exactly 400 verses where the word peace occurs, 400 verses, from Genesis to Revelation. 400 in the Bible represents a divine perfect time period. In Acts chapter 7, I believe verse 6, we see that Stephen in his testimony before the Jews, he stated, your descendants will live in a foreign country where they will be slaves and will be badly treated for 400 years. Well, that got me to thinking. 2019 minus 400, 16, 19 AD. I thought, well, nothing happened then. But I had to see. I had to see if anything interesting occurred that year, 16, 19, just out of curiosity. And something did 400 years ago. Approximately 20 slaves arrived in Jamestown, 
which eventually led to the growth and development of slavery throughout the British colonies in North America. Coincidence? I doubt it. Now, personally, I take that determination by a sovereign God in which there are no coincidences, nothing happens by chance, to signify that there is, in fact, something highly significant about the year that we're in, or more specifically, 5778. So I just want to throw that out there for those of you who, who like that stuff as much as I do. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Marvelous, marvelous verse. Couldn't wait to get to this verse. The therefore is more than just a glance back to verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And I pointed out, and I believe in the last study, that the word for is dia in the Greek. He was delivered because of our offenses. He came to die in our place. And he was raised again because the price that he paid was sufficient. That's why he was raised. And I took you into the wonder of the fact that he who knew no sin was made sin for us. And that with supplication and great tears, he was heard and he was made perfect. And he became the author, the author of our salvation. That's beginning to end. What happened to the one who was made sin? That I might be made and you might be made righteous. And the scriptures declare that he, having been made perfect, complete, became the author of eternal salvation. The therefore of chapter 5, verse 1, which is where we're at, the therefore, the word therefore, includes all of the previous four chapters. It's, it seems to me the Holy Spirit went out of his way, he went out on a limb to point out to us that we are totally depraved. And, and what astounds me are messages and articles that I read, that people send me, or that I've read over the years, where that where they purport to believe in the total depravity of man and then destroy the very concept by casting back upon man the responsibility of his redemption. Folks, our study here started out highlighting man's total depravity. If you follow these videos, you've seen that. The reason that I can't flap my arms and fly to the moon is because I don't have the ability to do it. There's a lot of things I don't have the ability to do. And borning myself again is one of them. The reason, and the reason that the natural man cannot please God is because he doesn't have the ability to do it. He can't will to do it. Because he doesn't have the ability to do it. Man is totally depraved. And in that condition, in that condition, God made his own righteous. Therefore, being justified by faith. Now, we had that back in chapter 3. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption of that's in Christ Jesus. It's a finished transaction. My Bible says, therefore being justified, but it's an aorist, passive, aorist, passive, participle. I don't want to give too many lessons on grammar. I, don't, I really don't have the time to do that, but grammar is important if we are to get the meaning from the text. The folks, the aorist participle precedes the action of the main verb. 
the present participle is concurrent with the action of the main verb. You can almost ask any English teacher out there. They'll tell you the same thing. But the, the perfect and the aorist precede the action. Therefore, having been justified, that's the aorist participle. We have peace with God. The justification, the being made righteous, preceded the peace with God. It just seems redundant to spend any time on being justified, and that's the grand concept of this book. It's the grand concept of the, of the Word of God. Do you have any idea, uh, some of you do, I'm sure, of just how few people realize that they've been made righteous without a cause? God did not make you righteous because you're better than somebody else. or because of anything that you did. I've suggested this many times. If you want to look at it from the human standpoint, the human standpoint, if that's the filter that you want to look, you know, if God is going to send anybody to heaven, well, it ought, then it ought to be you, right? I mean, I'll look, I mean, look at the whole world. I mean, even being modest as, as you could be, I mean, I mean, you know, you got to be in the top 10%. Right. I mean, look at the other nations. Look at the horror of some of the of the so-called civilized people. I mean, where would you put yourself? And that's the problem. That's the problem. I'm getting emails from brothers now that are coming out of that and seeing the difference here, seeing how this is this truth is that Christianity is basically man centered. Biblical theology is God-centered. It's Christ-centered. I may have mentioned this before. I don't know. Uh, several years ago, I was, I was driving with another individual, and we were coming from a Bible class, and I noticed that he was crying. And, and I was like, well, you know, what in the world's wrong? Men don't cry. And he said, well, I've just been trying to figure out why God loves me. You know that's a that's a blasphemous thought. Just to, just to just to say, or even wonder, or to, or to ask, why does God love me? I mean, to say why does God love me infers that there is some reason that He loves you, and, and not somebody else. That He loves you and doesn't love somebody else. The reason God loves you is you're His child. That's why He loves you that you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's what we read in Ephesians, right? Early on in Ephesians. I think probably uh, in the first couple of videos of Ephesians. What do you think it means to be chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world? I was in Fort Smith this last week. Well, that, you know, well, that makes it hard to preach the gospel, you know, the guy says. you got to be kidding. It, it makes it wonderful. Dearly beloved, God chose you for himself before the foundation of the world, and because you were totally depraved and a sinner, he became your kinsman redeemer, and he died in your place that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. My question to you is, what grander message would you want to carry? And, and somebody says, now, wait a minute, Steve. Mate, wait a minute. Maybe they're not one of God's children. I wouldn't know. Be honest, most Christians I meet don't look like saints. I mean, they're not the kind of people I'd choose. You know, one has a temper... One smells like fish. That's not my job. Paul didn't look like God's child until after 
the Damascus experience, but he always was. The same thing applies to him as applies to us. I've been highly criticized for saying, but I'm going to say it again. If the Apostle Paul had died when he was four years old, he'd have gone to heaven. Why? Because he was Christ's be before the foundation of the world, because he was God's child. Of course, it, it could also be argued that Paul could not have died when he was four years old. He was basically immortal at that point. Folks, we're all too prone to make it depend upon the human decision, the human mind, the human will, human works. Therefore, having been justified, and we know from chapter 3, that was freely by his grace without a cause. He did not make you righteous because you're better than some other people. He didn't make you righteous because there's something in you that deserved it. He made you righteous because you were his child from before creation. That is what this book teaches. You were chosen, elect in Christ before the foundation of the world. That was a long time ago. Ordained to eternal life. We're talking about the God who created the heavens and the earth here. And if you believe, it's because you're redeemed and never in any in any biblical concept, were you ever redeemed by believing? Folks, you believe his word because you're his. You believe it because you're his. Because you belong to him. Because you are his child. Having been justified. And we know that was without a cause. By the grace of God through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Just finished replying to an email this morning reminding the brother that it's the problem is just we don't believe what God said. Therefore, because of that, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. Now, wait a minute. That says that there are people at war with God. And to be sure, that's true. I kind of touched on that in my last video. For those of you out there who believe that there's a kingdom age when Christ rules and reigns and righteousness and and we rule with him, and we reign and rule with him for a thousand years, and the lion lies down with the lamb, or the wolf lies down with the lamb. I, I don't know. And I can't tell whether you, you folks are amillennials, postmillennial, premillennial, premillennial, or no millennial, but if you accept the concept that Christ comes back ruling personally in Jerusalem, reigning in righteousness, no war for a thousand years. Think of it. Think of that. There, there has never been one day of peace in your lifetime. There hasn't been in mine. In the whole world, there's never been one day without war. Imagine a thousand years without it. I mean, uh, imagine what Israel could do with 50% of their budget, you know, for you know, for military expenses, if they didn't have to, you know, to spend any of it. You know, we here in America, you know, suppose we had no, and we spend a lot. <clears throat> suppose we had no military budget. A thousand years. How in the world could Satan get anybody at the end of that period of time to rise up to try to overthrow Christ? And yet, that's man's attitude toward God. The natural man is at war with God. We have peace with God. The concept here that we have peace with God is going to be stated differently when we reach the 8th chapter, uh, if we get there. 
Uh, you know, I, I, I wonder. I don't, you know, we have an incredible sign in the heavens in a few days. A total lunar eclipse, January 20, January 21. Uh, unlike anything we've ever seen. Marking the two-year anniversary of Trump taking office. With March 8, the end of this 5778, marking his 777th day as president. A man who, on the very day he was born, there occurred the same celestial event, a total lunar eclipse. I, I, I don't know if we'll be here or not, but because we are still here, I have great news for you. God has nothing against you. And I've had people say, no, wait a minute, Steve. Wait, you don't know what I've done. I mean, you don't know how I live. You're right, I don't. And I don't care. My Bible says that if you belong to Christ Jesus, God has nothing against you. Here's the Holy Spirit declaring in words that we cannot help but understand. Words that a five-year-old would understand. That we have peace with God. I've traveled this country over the years and I've met many a Christian who will, who will profess to love Christ and, and believe his word. And yet I find very few Christians who seem to have any peace. And I am here to tell you that whether you know it or not, you have peace with God. The concept of peace with God does not depend on you understanding it, you believing it, or you accepting it. Kind of helps if you do. The, but the simple truth is you are justified by the faithfulness of Christ, and you have peace with God. Now, whether you live that way or not, whether you believe that or not, does not alter the fact that it's true. You may not feel like you have peace with God. Of course, we don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. And I'm persuaded very few Christians do. Most of the Christians I talk to, they, they fear some judgment before God. And I am absolutely, absolutely willing to admit that there are rewards. It may be, it may be a, a big one. It may be none. But you're redeemed. You'll never stand in judgment before God. We have peace with God. You will give an accounting as, as, as any son or, or a person who's responsible to somebody else gives an accounting But there will be no judgment. You won't be beaten with any stripes. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's no other way. You don't have peace with God because you go to church every Sunday, because you jump through all the Christian hoops, because you fill in all the blanks because you're obedient, because you tithe, or because you witness, or because you don't because you don't rob stage coaches or steal horses. Bottom line is you don't have peace with God because you earned it. Such a thought as that, in my opinion, is blasphemous. From the natural standpoint, the people who, you know, I'm talking about the natural standpoint. The people who succeed are the people who, who work the hardest and they do the best job. Well, the one who did the best job in, in what we're talking about here is Jesus Christ. 
How good a job did he do? Perfect. The reason you are justified is by faith. Are you justified because you exercised faith? That's the question then that ultimately comes up. And I've tried to make that as clear as I can along the way as we've come to this point, and I'll continue to emphasize it, it, it is impossible to separate the faith that you exercise and the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Impossible to separate the two. And as it was with Abraham, the father of all who believe, your redemption is based on the faithfulness of what he did. Not on what you did. Your understanding of that is based upon how much you accept and believe that. And that with which you accept and believe that is the new man, the new creation, not the old. For the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. So, as new creations in Christ Jesus absolutely righteous, without spot, blameless before God, we have the privilege, the marvelous privilege, in an earthen vessel to exercise faith and trust in God. God, the one who is working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, I mentioned to a brother this week on Facebook, uh, not much for mentioning names, that, it, that if we delight ourselves in him, he'll give us the desires of our heart. And I said one thing that I found out over the, over the, over the years is that the desires of my heart are not what I thought they were. Because I have to conclude I have to conclude that what I've gotten, what I've received, is the desire of my heart. For God is working in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I mean, would you want anything else? Would you possibly want anything else other than the fact that God is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. I don't know why God does what he does. I mean, there's a, there's a thousand questions that I can't answer. But I trust the God of this book. I am justified from or on account of, because of the faithfulness of Christ. And I understand that from the exercise of the faith that God has given me as a new creation in Christ Jesus, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. But I've also noticed uh, we have a problem grammatically. And... In some translations, I almost wanted to say most translations. I can't really tell you it's most. In some translations, that's a present. In another translation, it's a subjunctive. If it, For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Greek grammar, subjunctive is the mood of uncertainty. Therefore, having been justified by faith, let us have peace with God. I think the preponderance of the evidence is for the present, but I mean, I can show you other, uh, I can point to other theologians who will tell you that it is for the subjunctive. One stresses the fact that the faithfulness of Christ has made it absolutely certain. So it's a present tense. The other the subjunctive would stress the fact that that the understanding of that is based upon your exercise of of the faith that God has given that he's given you 
there are areas that uh, that I've noticed over the years that there are areas that people are not certain of as it concerns the original text and and this is one of them and personally I think that's wonderful in several of these videos these studies I pointed out areas you know that we're not sure whether this word is that one or or another one and I think that in that will always be the case if you're doing this. And I think that's wonderful because we get two profound meanings out of that. And I think, and this is, I don't ask anyone to agree with me, I think that this is one of the areas where God has permitted the presence of two different forms of the same verb. We do have peace with God. That's, there's no doubt about it. That's one side of the truth. And it is absolute truth. On the other side of that, let us have peace with God. That is, let's recognize the truth of that peace. I want you to consider the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ came to his disciples after the resurrection. And he said, my peace I give unto you, and my peace I leave with you. So, there was a peace that was given and a peace that was left. And we have the exact same concept here. You absolutely have peace with God. How much you understand that and rejoice in it in, in the, is the exercise of the faith that God has given you. And that faith operates in conjunction with the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That faith is exercised by the new creation, not the old. We have peace with God and we have that by means of, through our Lord Jesus Christ, You'll notice back in chapter 3, it's those that believe that sinned and came short of the glory of God. Here, it's our, not all, it's our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of that. Think of that. He's ours, not everybody's. There's the we and the us. There's the they and the them. There's the sheep and the goats. There's the wheat and the tare. Once again, we're limited to God's family. It's our, our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's we who have that peace with God. And there's another dia. By means of our Lord Jesus Christ, by means of whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Look at the also. The very word separates it from the concept that we've been looking at. We are absolutely justified freely by his grace. And justified means just what it said. You are made righteous by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Does that, does that holiness, that unblameableness, that unreprovableness, is that the result of your work or the work of Christ? And the answer, the answer has to be the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. But there's something more also. Also, we have access into that grace. Well, I'm out of time. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about how we, we exercise that access into grace unmerited favor, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful and thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to come together to study and to feast upon your word. I just ask you to seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.